So, Knit Underground. I have kind of a hard time explaining why this game is so special, but I guess it would be best to start with a little backstory. The Knit series is made up of three main games, all made by the Swedish indie developer known as Niflis, starting with the original Knit in 2006. The second game is Knit Stories in 2007, and of course the final one, and seemingly the last in the series, is Knit Underground, first released in 2012. Niflis has made quite a few other games, but the only other relevant one to talk about here is Within a Deep Forest, also released in 2006. Knit Underground's design is really a combination of the previous Knit games, plus Within a Deep Forest. In the future, humanity has seemingly gone extinct, and for most creatures, the surface world has become uninhabitable. The game is split into three chapters. In the first chapter, you're introduced to the protagonist, a sprite by the name of Me Sprocket, who is tasked with some sort of vague saving the world plot. As with the previous Knit games, Me can climb up any flat vertical surface, and so chapter one plays out like a pretty standard sort of platformer. In chapter two, suddenly you're playing as a bouncy ball. Remember within a deep forest? Well, that's where the idea came from. And in fact, Knit Underground is actually a direct sequel to Within a Deep Forest. In this game, it controls mostly the same as it did in Deep Forest. You can't climb as you did with me, but the ball moves very quickly, and you can bounce to gain a bunch of height. Chapters 1 and 2, though, are relatively short, and they act more like tutorials to the full game. And that would be good old chapter 3. In chapter 3, you can switch between me and the ball freely at just the press of a button, and you're given access to a massive, and I mean massive, 2D world to explore. Gone is any linearity here. Almost every part of the world is open to you right from the start, and so it's up to you to decide where you want to go first. Knit Underground has a really interesting and really indie style to its environments. Every solid surface is pitch black, whereas the backgrounds have a whole range of colors. These backgrounds tend to be made up of collages of real photographs, with leaves and flowers and rocks and crystals and all sorts of other objects. It's a distinctive style that I really, really like, and it leads to some of the most atmospheric and wonderful places you can find. On the other hand are the characters. Let's not sugarcoat it, the character art is terrifying. Big, bugged out eyes, stiff heads and limbs, the most ridiculous outfits and colors. Even the text boxes have these color gradients that remind me of like Windows 95 or 2000. Needless to say, the character art clashes pretty bad with how beautiful the environments are. It was one of the things that made me quit on my first playthrough of this game, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself on that. Let's get back to some of the more important gameplay aspects. Along with her climbing, Mi can pick up temporary power-ups. Each colored flower gives a different power-up. They're all single use, and they'll go away if you don't use them after a few seconds. Red gives you a super jump. Blue lets you fly horizontally until you cancel it or hit a wall. Yellow is the same as blue, except vertical instead of horizontal. Green lets you fly in any direction for a few seconds. White is a projectile that can take out enemies. And last is the very rare pink, which turns you invisible. The ball can't use these power-ups, but instead it has a special power of its own. The ball can attach itself to certain types of robots with a sort of grappling hook. When you combine all this together, Mii's temporary power-ups and the ball's grappling hook, plus the ability to switch between them, you get a game that can actually have a lot of fun movement once you get the hang of it. It can have you zooming around the environments, and solving the puzzles without too much trouble. Because this game is so exploration heavy though, it's important to note that enemies and puzzles aren't really the main focus of it. You will spend a lot of time in Chapter 3 crossing through rooms that are technically empty. Some long stretches with no NPCs, or enemies, or items, or puzzles. I know several people that have quit because it seems like the world is just so big and there's not a lot happening in it. That was also a factor on my first attempted playthrough. But now, it's one of the reasons why the game is near the top of my favorites. There's something downright magical about Knit Underground's world and the different parts that make it up. 
All the little details, the colors, the photo collages, the little bugs or weird animals walking around, empty houses, giant abandoned temples, the bones of some long lost creature. To me, it's visual storytelling at some of its finest in gaming. And there doesn't need to be an explanation to how the underground got to be this way. It's just exploring and taking your time and looking forward to what area you'll find next, whether it has a reward at the end of it or not. These are the kinds of things that keep me coming back to this game. Even when I've been through it multiple times and I know what I'm gonna find, somehow it still works. Another big contributing factor, of course, is the sound design. Sometimes in this game, there is no music playing at all. It's just the wind, or the rustle of leaves. When the soundtrack does kick in though, oh man does it do an excellent job. This is one of my favorite game soundtracks ever. The version you can find uploaded on YouTube is 76 songs at three and a half hours. The full version on Bandcamp is 118 songs at around four hours and 42 minutes. Sure, some of these are just like 10 second jingles that were included for completion's sake, but overall the soundtrack is this wonderful collection a lot of it is very ambient, but hey, that fits the game perfectly. Some of my top picks include North and South. Please exist, I'd appreciate it. Ride the train to Denmark. Underwater Lab Tune. Scales of Zordium. Fish in the Sky. The Swamp Engineer. Vanishing. And my favorite of the whole bunch, Shans. This OST adds so much to the game's atmosphere and I can't imagine how it would be without it. Now, Chapter 3 is already long enough on its own, especially if you want to 100% it, which, yes, I have done three separate times, and yes, it was worth it. But if you do want more, oh man does this game deliver in terms of secrets. As you've noticed in the footage, the camera doesn't follow you and instead transitions from screen to screen. When it comes to the total number of screens, at least a quarter of this entire game is just secrets. I made a compilation video a while back on these secret rooms. It's 2 hours and 17 minutes. That's the condensed version. If you actually explore them, it'll take quite a bit longer than that. Some of these are linear challenge areas, which are tougher platforming sections than anything you can find in the regular game. Other areas expand on the lore, or even tell stories of entirely different characters. The amount of time and effort just put into these secrets is actually pretty insane. It adds so much more content, and a lot of people probably don't even know these areas exist. So if you are playing the game, I encourage you to try looking in some unexpected spots. Not just in the chapters themselves, but also the chapter select area. You never know what you might find. Difficulty wise, Knit Underground is very forgiving. There are auto checkpoints all over the place, so if you do die, you'll typically be respawned on the exact same screen. If you want something a bit harder, there are those secret challenge areas that I just mentioned before. But I think that the quick respawns are pretty fitting given the overall chill nature of the game. In case you were wondering, there is a fast travel system to help you get around the giant world. And it's worth bringing up because it's very unique. 
in certain locations you can break a dimension crystal in order to enter the Disorder. The Disorder is this dark, creepy, and mysterious world that has its own set of rules you need to learn in order to navigate it. If you run out of time while inside the Disorder, you'll be kicked out back to where you started, minus one dimension crystal. Compared to many fast travel systems out there, which usually involve just clicking a button and teleporting, this one is much more player involved and interesting to figure out. You can come across more dimension crystals while exploring the regular world, and I'm pretty sure I've never run out of stock during a playthrough. But by requiring a consumable item, this game does force you to think about when and how to use its fast travel system with some more careful consideration. The last topic I want to go over is a bit more of the writing and characters. Me Sprocket was born unable to speak, and so in chapter 1, she's given the help of two fairies to do the talking for her. These two are Dora and Celia, and even though they're great friends, they could not be more opposite in terms of personality. One of the biggest themes across Knit Underground is religion versus science. Sure, this can kind of be handled in a painfully indie and pretentious way, but I also think this game takes a neutral enough approach where it lets you come to your own conclusions. Dora the fairy is more kind and welcoming, and trustworthy, sometimes to a fault. Whereas Celia is more of a cold and cynical asshole, but one who knows how to listen and be more open at times. She's also hilarious. Dora is a follower of Myriadism, which seems to be the primary religion of the underground. On the other side is a group called the Internet, and yes, it's really called that, who take a more scientific approach, collecting and studying human artifacts. Whenever you run into an NPC and you need to speak, you're given the option to send out either Dora or Celia. This is another thing that lets you decide parts of your story as you go. Do you send Dora out to be nice and helpful? Or do you send out Celia to tell everyone to fuck off? These characters are more than just your talking proxies too. They each have their own storylines which you could potentially miss out on if you don't do all of Chapter 3. I couldn't stand these characters on my first playthrough, but now I kinda love them. <laughs> so yes, the character designs are unsettling flesh demons. The main storyline is pointless. The dialogue can be completely ridiculous. Would it be a better game without these things? Uh, maybe. But then it wouldn't be Knit Underground anymore. I do think it has some genuinely great moments and great things to say in the side stories, and the parts that I did used to hate have now become these charming oddities that I love. It's hard to say exactly why this happened. Back in 2016, I would have told you this is one of the worst platformers ever made, and now it's one of my top 10 favorite games, period. So with the right mindset, and some patience, and a love for exploration, and an expectation that things might seem ugly at first. I think in the long term, Knit Underground can turn out to be one of the most rewarding platformers out there. It's a one-of-a-kind world that's holding a lot of told and untold stories under its surface, and I would highly recommend checking it out, and sticking with it if you can. The previous Knit games, and Within a Deep Forest, are still available online for free, so you can check those out too if you liked this game. To me, Knit Underground is by far the best of the bunch, but if you want to try another, I would probably go with Knit Stories. The game comes with an easy-to-learn level editor, and there's an archive with hundreds of different fan-made levels available. But for now, that's where I'll end things off. Thanks for tuning in.